are more accurate than pairwise alignments, sequence sequence alignments. The next step on gaining accuracy is profile profile, where you simply use two of these profiles, or you compare one profile against an entire database of these profiles. With these profile profile methods, you can intrude deeply into the twilight zone and almost into the midnight zone. Midnight, yes? So the family, essentially, how do I get this, this uh, family? How do I get this profile at the first place? Anybody remembers that? Okay, let's get back to what would I expect you to be able to do. Uh, I do not really feel that you have to learn all the words and all the things. So you should learn the ideas. It may not hurt if you know, some, it could explain a little bit the idea of hashing, what the problems of hashing are in this context, and that this is called BLAST. If you know the idea of dynamic programming, that's the kind of thing I want you to understand. Uh, but I do, I would hope in the exam that you can answer that question. That's the type of question that has been asked many times, and that's the type of question that I had hoped everybody in the room by now would have been able to answer. So the seeds in the hashing algorithm, they are sort of the seeds for aligning two sequences. These are not the seeds for aligning an entire family. So the question here is, how do I, what I show is a family, what I show is a set of sequences. I, I don't know how many there are, guess it. I mean, maybe there are 20 what I show there. Uh, you guys are faster in counting than I am. Uh, the family can, families such as this can have a thousand or more members. So how do I get these thousands that are the initial family? I say sequence profile is better than sequence sequence than pairwise alignment. But if so, I have first have to get this profile. Where do I get it from? Where do I get the group of things that are related? By pairwise alignment, exactly. In, in fact, you asked uh, on, on Tuesday, when do I stop or how do I get the... You, you asked the same question on Tuesday. Uh, you, you do it by building up the, the pair, through pairwise alignments. Pairwise alignment I can do, so I map something to, I map the problem to that problem. I build up a set of pairwise alignments. I have a threshold that I showed with the HSSP distance there, uh, with this curve that had length and percentage sequence identity. If you're above the curve, I add that to the family, and at some point I simply have the family, and that I call the profile. And then I use that profile and go again against the entire database. Why, just a sec, why can it be different? So when I do, I, in both cases, I do the same sequence against the database. Why do I do it again? So I run, I take the sequence, do pairwise alignments against everything in the database, 85 million, build up the family. Now I take the profile and I run it against the 85 million. What does it gain to take the profile in the second round? Yes? We find new proteins because this is more accurate because now we are actually f zooming into what is important, what is more important and less important. This is because pairwise alignment is less accurate than profile sequence alignment. And the, in the simple way you do every single of the 85 million, you do the profile against every single of the 85 million. Okay? You had another question? Yes, so maybe that's too technical and you just call it this. But uh, when you're doing this sequence to sequence and build up a family, should this every pair be below the threshold? So, when I do, uh, the question is, when I do a sequence sequence, by the way, what we're discussing now, whenever you, the several people ask me uh, in, uh, at the end of last lecture, what part is important? So I, I, f I zipped a little bit three, too quickly through a couple of, too many slides because I want to get to the secondary structure prediction to the machine learning part. And today is the last lecture in which I zip. But what I say now, all of this is the kind of stuff that will be in the exam. That, that's the part, that, that's the level you clearly have to understand. So the question here was, when I build up the family, again, I build up the family by pairwise alignment, by taking one sequence and aligning it against 85 million. Pairwise, every single one is a pair, right? The, the query sequence against the first, second, and so forth, and all of 85 million pairwise alignments. So when I, then the question was, I have a threshold then I, that allows me to say part of the family, yes or no. 
for these pairwise alignments. So the question here was, do I apply the threshold to every single comparison? So everyone who comes into the family in the first round, will that have to be under some threshold or above some threshold? So more similar than something, okay? What's the answer? Can anybody answer that? Is this is a yes or no, and you can guess, but... Uh, can I have a hand, show of hands on yes? So again, uh, does everybody have to be uh, similar? Can I have a show of hands on no? Uh, can I have a show of hands on sleep? <laughs> so this is an interesting case because obviously it proves that you're totally awake. <laughs> uh, thank you for that proof. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying that because uh, some of you may see that the vast majority of the group, group uh, when given the choice yes or no, says none of the two. Uh, listen guys, in logic, tertium non datur. Uh, there is no third option, you have to choose one of these two. Anyway, yes was the right choice in this particular case. Yes, every single one. And the threshold, again, when you do the second round, that's why Psi Blast, position specific iteration, Blast, the iteration is exactly that. You run, in the second round you run with a profile. In the third round you run with a refined profile. Fourth round another refined profile. And by the way, this stops whenever the profile is not changing anymore. Okay, um, or whenever you, you force the algorithm to stop because you don't have enough CPU. Today, so I said blast is very fast. A single blast hit today on a typical processor and a single processor uh, takes roughly 40 minutes. Uh, yeah? How do I find like, an appropriate threshold? So because I That's the threshold the is too high, then I would successfully iteratively add all the sequences in the database and then I Oh, that's a, so you, you say a very, very, very important thing that I usually show with a couple of slides. Uh, so what he says is, how can I make sure that the threshold is right? And I'll answer that in a minute. And the second thing he says, and that's very, very important, because if I put in the first one here that is above the threshold and that is a mistake, so let's just look at this profile here. This profile, there are some columns, four columns are entirely conserved. So it means, so the simplest way of using that profile, those four columns you essentially have to match, okay? Now you make one mistake and the column is no longer essentially conserved. So the example, don't read it too, too closely. Some of you are beginning to, to really read what I'm right. So some, there are some changes in there, uh, but there are cases this is not quite that, but there are cases where it's entirely conserved. And if you have, have cases where it's entirely conserved, the first one that is a mistake will completely mess it up. So you could have a thousand sequences and one new can completely change the reality from entirely conserved to not entirely conserved. Even if it's only one, from one per minute, it's not entirely conserved anymore. And that completely changes the way the next one is aligned. So how do I avoid that? And that is, you would have to go back to the slides from Tuesday. And Tuesday I showed you this um, threshold where I had percentage sequence identity here, PIDE, uh, versus the length of the alignment. And I had an empirical function, uh, a couple of important points of this empirical function. If you have 11 residues that are identical, you cannot say anything about structural similarity. It's just too short. Uh, another point that, that is sort of relevant is here, if you have more than 250 residues aligned, then 20% sequence identity roughly is enough. So if you have more than 25% sequence identity. And then there's a function in between. That's the saturation point here. It's, it's around 250, 300. Uh, or the, the point about 100 here uh, is for 100 residues, it's 33. So if at 100 residues aligned, more than 33 are identical, so 33 in 100. So you can change 67 residues uh, and still maintain structure. Or if they naturally evolve, they still maintain structure because everything above the curve has similar structure. And that's exactly your threshold. And it's empirically done, is the answer to that question. So there are different ways of doing it. They are more statistical, uh, using E-values. This one is empirical, yes? I assume that you all have understood that, so is it, I still repeat it, is it more important to keep out wrong one than, than 
to miss some of the right ones? Uh, the answer is clearly yes, in particular in when you iterate. So while you build up the profile. So again, this profile will be used to again scan the 85 million. So say after four rounds of, of this, you, you have a convergence. So the profile is no longer, so between the fourth and the fifth time, the profile looks the same. And the same could be the identical numbers or numbers, the difference in the numbers is less than some epsilon, whatever your criterion is, we define no change. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, and now in this fifth run, now you can sort of include some that are where, where you may be wrong because the profile is no longer changing. So now at the end of the day you get an alignment and whether in this 2000 uh, there are 50 wrong or not, you don't care. But if you mess up the profile, then in the next run you could completely pick up a new family. And you could jump from 2000 to 4000 and believe that you sort of find a remote, remotely similar uh, related organism with a similar structure that you found gold instead you found something else. Uh, let's not spell it out. Um, there was a question? Yeah, I think I asked. Okay, this is why in the beginning for the iteration the answer is very clearly keep out mistakes so be as clean as possible. The downside to that is if, I mean the, the, the most extreme way of doing that is you keep the threshold so high that you absolutely cannot make mistakes. But the higher you keep it the less diverse this, this function will get and the less you will gain by actually the iteration. Now, if you take anything that is only 90% sequence identity between round one and two, there's almost no change, if, if at all. So you have to sort of go to the point where it's a little bit risky. That's the trick or that's the secret or that's the, the art or whatever you call that. Um, and that in fact is the problem for profile profile comparison because somehow it gets more complicated if you have two profiles where you risk that both of them have a tiny mistake uh, and that's one of the issues. Um, so is there any other question? If not then let's get to 3D prediction and again I'm going to zoom through this today uh, just to have in the next lecture that we will have more time. Can we predict protein structures from, from, from first principles? So Epstein and Anfinsen in 61 already showed that sequence uniquely determines structure. That means you take a sequence, you throw it into a solvent and you get the same three-dimensional structure again and again and again. Okay? This means that the entire information for the way it's folding is contained in this 1D sequence. And if that is the case, then we should be able to actually compute that. We, the folding is done by, um, uh, by atoms that attract each other or, or repulse each other. There are some simplified energy potentials. Uh, and you should be able to actually do that by first principles, or at least by molecular dynamic simulation. And in fact, in the 60s, there was a publication in the Washington Post that said the protein structure prediction problem or the protein folding problem as it was uh, coined then has been solved. And it's not often that, that science get into gets into Washington Post in particular in those days. In the 70s there was an article in New York Times that just in the 70s the protein folding problem had been solved. And then in the 90s there was another one. And somehow, you know, if you get three times big newspaper coverage and three times in three decades, the same problem has been solved. You sort of begin to see that there's something wrong with the story, right? You cannot solve the same problem uh, 30 years in a row or something. Um, and in fact, the problem was not that people cheated. The problem was that people really believed they had solved it. So that brings up this simple question here. How can you assess? whether you're doing right or not, whether you actually have solved the problem. So you're trying to simulate uh, from first principles, you're trying to fold and predict the structure. How could you check whether you are right? What you definitely know for some of them what structure is, you just compare your model result to the target structure. Okay, so I know some proteins for which I experimentally have the answer for how they look. And then I see whether my simulation gets there. And guess what? That's exactly what they did. Why? What could have gone wrong? Maybe it was 
said that it's so expensive to get these structures, and you have to use you have to use the structure the node structures also to create your prediction model or however you do it. So yes. Yeah, so so the, I'm not going to quite say what he says. Let's call it, uh, he has the social answer. So there's a high incentive to tweak reality. Uh, let's just call it that. Um, and yes, but actually, none of those cases was like that. I, in particular, I, I sort of was very close to the last one of these here. Uh, so there was no cheating. I, I mean, that is, it depends on how you define the word. Uh, they, they clearly were a victim of a mistake they made. That's clearly true. But they did not voluntarily cheat. Uh, so how could you do it? Yeah? Maybe they just, they limit your, uh, their knowledge was limited about the existing structures and then the new structures came and ruined their practice. That's a great idea. And that's in fact the idea of CASP, a meeting that is called CASPs, Critical Assessment of Protein Structure. So the way it works, um, from April to May, the organizers of CASP contact people who will do experimental structures. Uh, so they simply ask any friend they have. I was at some point I was a co-organizer of CASP, so you you write a lot of email to everybody you know, ask them, is there in your pipeline a structure that will come out over the next month? So that at this point nobody knows, but you're sure that within the year or within this year you will actually get an experimental structure. And if they say yes, then we take the sequence and then there is a prediction season from June to August. So these sequences are sent out to predictors and then there's a deadline. And the deadline for sending in your prediction is just before the manuscript is submitted. So before anybody in the world other than the group that does the structure and the groups who do the structure, experimental structures, they, are, they don't participate. Uh, so before anybody else in the world has ever seen it. Um, and then at some point in September, November, so August is the final submission deadline. Sometime in September to November, the assessors, so the people who assess how well we the, the did, uh, meet do their assessment and then in December there is a meeting where everybody discusses how well they did. And that again is, exa that is exactly the way we sort of tried as a field, we tried to avoid that there would be another publication in New York Times or wherever that the problem has now been solved uh, without reality to it. Um, and there's a few findings from these cast meetings. What I show here uh, is over the years of CASP, so they every two years, they happen every two years, the number of groups you see even until 2004 and increased further. Uh, there is a constant increase of the number of groups who participate. And the essential finding from the first 10 CASP, or the first 20 years of CASP, is that essentially the only thing that really works is comparative modeling or homology modeling. And I'm going to talk about what that is for the remainder of the lecture. I'm first going to uh, introduce a little bit how our structure is determined. Uh, that means that in fact there's the other statement. There is no generic or general structure prediction, 3D prediction. So whenever we try to predict 3D structure from the sequence alone through MD, it actually fails. Okay. So we get somewhere, and I'm not entirely sure whether over the course of this semester, so there is the attempt of a machine called Anton in New York by, by David Shaw uh, and his group. They have essentially put a lot of money into building a parallel machine that can do MD very, very fast. So they do the hardware, the software, and everything optimized to this particular problem and have created a machine that is many orders of magnitude faster than anything else in the world. Uh, by, by strong dedication and, and uh, substantial funding, private funding from David Shaw himself. Uh, and so this is in fact the state of the art and they really get somewhere now, uh, but they still don't get for an entire protein uh, generic 3D structure from sequence yet. Uh, and that is, there are many, many improvements in the field and one set of improvements that people learned is that we, the combination of methods, I call it meta servers here, uh, helps to improve many aspects of structure prediction. Now, let's get into how are 3D structures determined. Uh, so again, there is this sort of detailed view of a protein structure, there's the cartoon view. By experiment we do that, so today there are about 120,000 protein or 121,000 proteins in the database. 
as of yesterday. Of these, about 10,000 are X-ray, 10,000 10, NMR, and about 1,000 uh, EM. They're all deposited in the protein data bank, PDB. And let me show you uh, on the myoglobin structure how that works. So you begin in X-ray crystallography. What you, the first step is, you take your protein, you, as it is called, express. You make it available in the tube in a high density, in such a high density that the protein grows a crystal. Okay? There are in fact some proteins uh, in the outer membrane of bacteria that sort of form crystal-like structures in, in situ, in biology, uh, in vivo, on their own, but there are very few of those. For most, you have to sort of help them a little bit, let's call it like that. Uh, then you uh, put an X-ray beam uh, a very, very dense X-ray beam, so typically this is done at Geneva, at CERN now, uh, so it's very good photon sources. In fact, the, what, what used to be the, the sources for high energy physics is increasingly taken over by biology, and this is exactly what it is used for. So you shoot these beams into the crystal, and then there's a diffraction pattern. And since the crystal, again, the crystal structure is formed simply because you have a repetition of the same protein and again and again and again. Right? You have a crystal lattice formed by proteins. And then, so there is a very clear order in this thing. And according to this diffraction pattern, you can build, you do a phase transition, you do build an electron density map. Uh, and from this electron density map, through a fitting model, you actually get the atomic model. So there's a lot of computation in here, a lot of fitting in there. Uh, and getting it from the diffraction pattern to the, uh, to the model, in fact, is, there's a lot, of, a lot involved today, but ultimately today this is largely automated. Largely automated means that if you have a very good crystal, so good crystal is defined as uh, the, the, the light that shines through it, the diffraction pattern is, called, is all, for all the proteins the same. Essentially, you get a very clear signal and if you get a clear signal, then you can essentially do uh, protein structure within a week or a little bit more than that. And this is largely uh, done by computers, experts using computers, so there's some visual fitting into it, but largely computers, yes? So the question is, and this is another good question that I unfortunately, due to the shortness of this lecture, I cannot address directly. Uh, so the question is the following. The, I said that proteins have to be somehow forced to get into this crystal. In the cell, they are not sitting in a crystal. And then I determine the structure of the protein. How do I know that the protein that I see after, this crystal, after, the, crystal has been, after the crystal has been formed is actually the same as the protein in solution? So the protein in the body. How do I know these are the same 3D structures? Um, and there, there's a variety of answers to this. Uh, one answer is, despite being a crystal, it contains evidence for motion. So this electron density here fits better in some places than others. And sometimes this more fit or less fit has to do with the crystal not being good. But if the crystal is good, whether or not you fit very well, has to do with motion. And that's intrinsic motion. From this intrinsic motion, you sort of can suspect this means function. If it means function, you can see whether you can relate that to binding sites. If you can, then you already picked up one aspect of function out of that crystal, right? And that is, in fact, what people do. That's one way of doing it. Uh, another way of doing it is, uh, that's a remarkable story. When we assign secondary structure, we can actually, from the crystal, see uh, alternative models, so to speak. But that's a longer story, and I'll just leave it there. But here's another answer to your question. An alternative way of getting a structure is nuclear magnetic resonance. And there, what you essentially do is you take the protein in a solution that is very similar to the one that you have in the body. So we assume that in this tube here, the protein is sitting exactly the same way as it's sitting in the cell. Okay? That's a solution that resembles the, the situation in the cell, other than I said that the cell is densely packed, so that you don't have. Essentially, you're completely dissolved here in solvent. But the solvent that is directly around a protein resembles the solvent that is in this pipette. Okay? Then you take the pipette, 
and put it into a magnet and uh, sort of uh, from that essentially then determine through the way the protons relax you essentially get proton-proton uh, coupling. Through the proton-proton coupling, you get an idea about which residue is close to each other, and through the residue being close to each other, you get the 3D structure. Because I told you that if you had the entire distance map, you would essentially get a protein 3D structure. So that part is clear. How we get from, from the data here, so you see a proton-proton excitement that may say, so the, the, there is an R residue and an A residue being next to each other, but the protein has more than one R and more than one A. And that is a lot of additional work that you have to do to resolve which of those is the case. You do another measurement, you label them, there's all kinds of, of issues involved. Uh, yeah? I'm just curious whether people try to do this close methods to the same protein Yes, uh, get to that in a, in a sec. Oh, I can do it. In, I can do it immediately. So people have, in fact, uh, done NMR and X-ray crystallography on the same protein, and this is one way in which we find out that there is that there is, in fact, that the 3D structure from the X-ray is similar to the one in solvent, uh, and. So there's a variety of studies like that. I just wanted to give you an idea about the kinds of machines that are used, and this is now outdated here, that is in City College in, in New York. Um, and so you, I don't see, you see the person up here. Uh, so that's the magnet, right? Uh, so these are big magnets. So if you believe that the ones that you see for medicine are big, these things are huge. So this is a whole, uh, that is many times bigger than this room here. Uh, and if you enter that with your credit card or your wallet, then you don't have to worry about your credit anymore. Uh, you enter this space, everything is a gunner. Uh, every, every, every sort of electronic material. So because the, the magnetic fields, even if they are off, they are so strong of these, these huge machines. Anyway, so this gives us, as I show here, roughly 1% of all the known structures. And the reason why this is small is because we cannot do very long proteins. And that is ultimately exactly this issue. I said we have 20 different residues. Uh, and the more you saw, see repetition, so you too many R's, and then it really gets complicated. That's one issue. Uh, and the other issue remains that I said within a week or so, you can do an X-ray structure. Once you have a crystal, once you have a good diffraction, it's sort of automated. This one here is the best expert in the world, still works on it at least three months. And that's a good, good case. That's a lucky case. Uh, and there are not that many experts who can do this sort of thing. So there's a lot of additional stuff in order to probe which ones are really the ones that, that match. That's why, there's another reason why there are so few of those. Uh, another method is electron microscopy, and also the cryo-electron, so you, you freeze it. Uh, and what I show here is 4 angstrom, 8 angstrom, 16 angstrom, 32 angstrom resolution. What it means that if you had a uh, resolution and accuracy, so to speak, of 32 angstrom, then the protein would look like it looks here. If you had a 4 angstrom resolution, you would really begin to see substructures, right? Uh, you see that there are sort of spheres in there, that there's a hole in here, there's a bigger hole in here. So this kind of thing you don't, well, this hole you sort of see. Uh, but you see much more detail in the four angstrom and the higher resolved structure. Uh, so again, higher resolved, more accurate is on the right side, the smaller number. And you can see that anyway, uh, cryo-EM will only see the surface. So in some cases, you see that there's a hole. You can look inside a little bit, but you really don't have atomic resolution. So even in the best case here, well, you get spheres, and you get relations of spheres. Uh, at this point, and this number is the one that rises the most here. We have a 1,000 about here. Uh, but th in some sense, this is the future. So pushing that to that level. And the next issue is, and that is again where computation plays an important role, you could imagine that, so th this is now the cryo-EM uh, that you see. And then you see whether underneath, by building models of the structure, you know what the sequence is that is in there. So can you, from sort of predicting some aspects of the sequence, can you possibly fit it to that, 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 so use the cryo-EM to get an outside image, use the computer to get something that is sort of constrained to look like that image. And maybe then 
you get an atomic resolved model for the structure. So this is not an experimental structure, but it's one where the computer and the experiment go hand in hand. Uh, in terms of resolution, higher resolution, I said this, this is an X-ray crystallography image. Uh, so in this particular case, it's the highest resolution, one angstrom, the lowest resolution of the ones that I show here is three angstrom. There's an electron density map in, in a light blue. And maybe it works a little bit better now. So maybe you can see from the back that there's a blue mesh around it. And the blue mesh is really the electron density map. And you see that the blue, uh, the, the ring here, there, there are many ways in which you could turn this ring around and still fits to the mesh. While in this particular case, there's just one solution. Well, maybe you can sort of wiggle a little bit. You cannot wiggle much because this point here is, well, is defined, right? You cannot get out there. Uh, you can maybe make it a little bit, push the, the, the bonds a little bit here, but also not much. Essentially, at that resolution, really the solution is very well defined. Uh, there are at this point very few structures at this resolution, but there are, I, I believe at this point, hundreds or a thousand at least. Uh, so this is the highest we can get and for some proteins we've reached this. Okay, 3D structure, experimental structure determination. Again, I said that many structures cost still over a million. The average now costs about $100,000 to do by these experimental methods that I said. That is not true for EM. Uh, EM is, is cheaper, but also doesn't really get atomic resolution. Uh, and we have that at this point for about 120,000. We have 85 million sequences known, and the difference is really high. For everything else, essentially all we can do is sort of 1D. And 1D brings us to the issue of secondary structure. Uh, they are stabilized by hydrogen bonds. And I'm sorry, it messed up again. I, I, I don't know, I fixed it. Um, so, this is Leonard, Leonard Pauling, and in 51 and 53, he published a bunch of papers uh, that defined secondary structure, and ultimately, this got him one of the two Nobel Prizes that he got. Uh, the other was for stopping the surface. A use of atomic web testing of atomic weapons a few years later. In 1954 he got it. So essentially it's the idea that secondary structure is completely explained by hydrogen bond formation. For helices he, he postulated that what you have, so if that is the, 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 the way the, the helix works, uh, that is the helix here, uh, uh, so you, 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 you work around like this, there is a hydrogen bond between residue I and I plus 4. And this goes around, right? And these hydrogen bonds stabilize the helix. And you immediately see that they stabilize the helix against being pushed like that. And what you can now do to the helix, you can slightly twist it, but essentially you create a, an object that in itself is stable and stabilized by hydrogen bonds. For the sheets, so two strands come together to form a sheet, we in fact get the hydrogen bonds between the two strands, okay? And that is shown here. Uh, and that these would be the most important secondary structure segments is what he postulated in 51, long before they were ever observed in 3D structure. So in 3D, in the detail of the cartoon, this is the sheet, or where one strand and another strand come together to, in this particular case, three strands come together to form a sheet, and the hydrogen bonds are in between these fingers. Uh, and the helices, the hydrogen bonds, are in between two, two turns of helix, with every I plus four, I and I plus four, I plus one and I plus five, and so forth and so on, right? You, you, you keep going. Uh, and here's the same view, just with a, with a uh, different representation, where now the helix is a rod, and the beta strands or the sheets are these arrows to indicate in which direction they run. So Linus Pauling got the Nobel Prize in 1954 for that. Um, what do you believe when was the first protein structure? Uh, 
So you believe they give out a, f a Nobel Prize for something that is, is, is predicted in 51 or 53? They give out the Nobel Prize in 54 without knowing whether it really exists? <laughs> they did. They really did. Uh, the first structures, my Globin, Ken John Kendrow, and in fact we have two Nobel Prizes right here, uh, and Max Perrotz. Uh, those are the first two structures, myoglobin and hemoglobin. Is anybody in the room, and they were done round about at the same time, so this was determined 58, this is 60, but both of those were at least 15 years in the making, so in that sense it's, it's about the same time. In fact, Max Perutz uh, started this, and the idea of using myoglobin came from John Kendrew, but he learned the techniques from Max Perutz. So, do, do you see anything when you look at these first two structures? Is there anything sort of jumping at you. So any observation? Yeah? So Yes. So this is in fact only alpha helices. Uh, and by the way, this is a two domain plotting here to, to made a build of two units. Yeah. And this is exactly what people believe. So the next structure was done in 67 and that was all also all helical. And people begin believing, okay, then Pauling got his Nobel Prize for, for discovering alpha helix, beta strands don't exist. And it's fair enough to give him a Nobel Prize because after all, you know, alpha helices he predicted uh, more than 10 years before they were seen, or almost 10 years before they were seen. So, seven years before they were seen. So, fair enough to give him a Nobel Prize, but for many years um, that, was, that was really uh, the idea that there were no beta strands. Um, how do we get secondary structure from the 3D structure? So how do we get actually to this, from this one to that view or that view? Uh, how can we annotate it? And essentially two ways of annotating. One is a method that is no longer uh, used really, use the geometry. So something that looks like a helix, something that sort of looks like two strands. That's the way that they do it. Uh, DSSP, and that is the method that, that is still in use, uh, it's very old, uses essentially the, the Pauling idea since the alpha helices and beta strands are stabilized by hydrogen bonds, why not look at the hydrogen bond pattern? Hydrogen, hydrogen bond pattern. Uh, and the beginning of the hydrogen bond pattern is essentially compiling uh, the Coulomb energy for a hydrogen bond and then you essentially look at do you have an I and I plus four uh, of a continuous region, then you call it a helix, do you have and this is sort of a, every second residue here is in a hydrogen bond and a beta strand. If you see that for two adjacent strands, you call, uh, two, adjacent, uh, two, two, two uh, places in the protein, then you call it a beta sheet or strands, yes? Is it always I plus 4? So the question is, is it always I plus 4? Again, we are talking about biology here. Nothing is always I plus 4. Uh, in fact, so the real answer is 3.6 on, on, on average. Uh, but in fact there are also two different types of helices. So there is one helix that you essentially take the I, roughly I plus 4 helix and you, you, you condense it a little bit, you, you push it down, it's an I, roughly I, I plus 3. Uh, and there's another one where you now have an I plus 5 where you essentially pull it a little bit. So, but these are the only two exceptions we know. And again it's not quite I plus 4. But nothing else what we have observed so far, yeah? The I plus four. So what I mean is, um, so when you uh, build up the helix, so so this is my helix, right? And my sequence runs uh, residue I plus one, two, three, four, and these two here have a hydrogen bond. And then one, two, three, four, and these two have a hydrogen bond. Sequence. I labeled the sequence with it. Every fourth, yes. It's basically every fourth residue or every third or every fifth. Essentially, yes. Yeah? I have a question on nomenclature. So, does alpha helix have better shit? And is there alpha something else have better something else? Oh, God. Now we are getting, getting into history. Uh, so, there's an alpha helix and a beta strand, a beta sheet. And that is simply because Linus Pauling sort of labeled his things. And uh, actually, so he got the Nobel Prize for two publications that I showed you. 
In the same issues of PNAS, he had eight different papers. He predicted eight different secondary structures. We have never observed them. Um, and that sort of is the, uh, the leftover of the alpha uh, and beta. So the, there, there are many others there. Um, he got the Nobel Prize on the ones that worked, right? Uh, but if you want to sort of repeat that, the first step is get eight papers into PNAS, uh, into the same issue of PNAS, right? That's the first trick. Uh, and then maybe you get a Nobel Prize for it later. Anyway, um, any other question on this? Yes? So this figure of the that machines one, two, three, four. Four is essentially four strands that form one sheet. There are only three. So this figure is the, oh, fair enough. Um, uh, so that's a very, very good point. I, uh, in, in order, if if I wanted to sort of pretend that this one is the same as this one, I would have to cut out one of the strands there. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. But other than that, in principle, it looks like this. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's true. Sorry. Um, and I, she should do that. Sorry for that. And thanks for that, actually. OK, so now let's get into comparative modeling. I have a fast run through comparative modeling. Uh, ah, yeah, I don't show the the number of slides. So similar sequences have similar 3D structures and again since the goal of structure prediction is to predict from the input the output the 3D structure since we know that sequence determines structure in principle similar sequences should have similar structures. Let's look at an ex a few examples here. This is one particular protein oncogene KRAS. Uh, some of you may, may sort of have seen the word oncogene. This KRAS is in fact the first protein that has been associated to cancer. Uh, so the first protein that, that people in the 70s and 80s identified as that person has cancer because of KRAS. Uh, in fact, not because of KRAS, so that's its structure. What you see here is the structure and the mutant. So you say an overlap here, an overlay of two, and the slides are from Andrea here, uh, Andrea Schefans. So you may be able to distinguish that there are, in fact, two different structures shown. So some places here, like this arrow, you see that there's a blue and a red. So these are two different structures. And they differ in, there's one variant. So there's a G at position 12. 12, 12 residue in the protein is a G. And that is mutated to a C. And this mutation actually causes cancer. And what you see is the overlay of the two proteins. One, the native that works fine, and one that, the one that essentially causes cancer under some conditions. And in fact, it's very subtle. You hardly can see it at all. What you see a little bit more here, so you see these loops, you begin to see a little bit difference here. And you see that the binding site begins, the, the way they bind, differs. And that's the crucial part. It seems small, but it has a great effect. Now, what I'm going to show you in the next one here is an overlay of two different proteins. So this is uh, the KRAS that I showed you before, and another protein in human that is called RASH. Uh, these two have 85% sequence identity. And again, they're very, very similar, right? In some cases you see that there are two helices here, uh, the, now we begin to see that the binding site is really rounded, or rather different. But for this helix, they look very similar. So there's a lot of similarity between, between these two. Let's go further and let's leave human now. We have RAP6 as a protein in fly. So our, uh, obviously very, very diverged from human. Uh, and in fact, that now has 28% sequence identity to the human protein, to the human KRAS. Uh, and you see again, the helix here comes out apart a little bit here. This helix now is indeed different. Uh, but the strands, the sheet itself looks still similar. And even the binding site looks still similar. Remember, this is a binding site I can sort of knock out by one change. And now we're down to 28% sequence identity, so a change of uh, 62, 72. Um, uh, 
so we are really, really at this point here, already in deep in the twilight zone. And here we get into the midnight zone. We have a protein that has only 19% sequence identity, and this one is a bacterial protein in purple. Uh, and again, it is still remarkably similar. Okay? Uh, and essentially, the idea of homology modeling is to find, to predict one, if I had only one of these here, to predict the, the others. Uh, and another way of putting it is to find everything that is similar to all the shapes that we know. How can we use that to... Uh, so how could we set up comparative modeling is the question that I'd like you to somehow discuss in small circles. So small circles is defined by whatever you feel... you define your neighborhood yourself. Uh, talk to, for, for two minutes with your neighborhood. Uh, some of you... Any group has an idea? No group has an idea? Yeah? A very fragile idea of maybe if you know structures for some of them, but it was discussed a couple of times already. So if you know exactly structures for crystallography, for uh, some of the proteins, you know, sequence code, and you don't know structures for others. Uh, you can treat your structure as a target in some way, introduce a loss function and do some kind of machine learning. But this is very general. So the idea here is you could machine learn the 3D structure? Is that what you say? Try it a bit. Yes, we could try that. But actually it's not trivial and this actually... So um, machine learning has not quite succeeded to predict 3D structure, 3D structure coordinate yet. Uh, I will show you some, hopefully at the end of the lecture, I will sort of show you some examples where it has succeeded. But most of the lecture will be occupied with simplified solutions for applying machine learning. So what he said is take the known structures and learn from it through machine learning. And essentially that so far we have not been able to do as a field. I will show you ways where, where the field has been able to do that for simplified aspects, but not 3D structure, for secondary structure. And we will get into that uh, in the next lecture. But how can we predict 3D structure through similarity? Anybody else? Any other group? Yeah? So, a group is a group from the side, uh, based on the thing of the stuff. I don't know whether everybody understood that, uh, but ultimately, in a, in a positive way, if you had written that in an exam, and I would be in a positive mood, uh, then I would say you have just explained comparative modeling to me, uh, and you get the points. Uh, over the next 46 slides that I'm going to rush through, uh, over the next 30 something minutes, I will show you exactly what you said with a few pictures and a little bit of additional bells and whistles. But that's exactly the solution. So you start with a query, protein sequence, in the protein data bank. So you have a protein of known three-dimensional structure that looks like this. For the known three-dimensional structure, uh, you actually have the structure. And then, essentially, what you say is that your query protein has exactly the same structure. That's the first approach and essentially that's the simple idea and we're going to refine from there. Uh, let me first give you an idea about what the reach of this is. So how many can I actually model with that in principle? Uh, and so from all organisms of life essentially roughly 13% so this is uh, all proteins known, 13% are sort of experimental in some sense. This is not quite all is known, there, there are some issues here. Uh, and here I can do a very, very high accuracy comparative modeling, here I can do still some sort of comparative modeling, and for the remainder I cannot do it at all. So more than half of the pie is one way of saying that. Uh, and again, the, the concepts, that I, I tend to use sometimes different words, Comparative model, there are two different words around homology modeling, comparative modeling, essentially is the same. Uh, and there is a target and there's a template. The, uh, the target is the protein that you want to model, so the one, the query that you don't know the structure for. The template is the one, essentially that is exactly the lingo that 
either of the two of you, no, you used it in Google template. Uh, that is the known structure that you essentially use to understand or to read the coordinates of. Uh, so that means that as a method, first you have to find a protein in the PDB. So if you start with a query, you have to first find a protein in the PDB that looks similar. Okay, and that you simply can do by the pairwise uh, alignment that we have seen be before. In fact, we can then do a sequence profile alignment and maybe more. And that gives me my, my template. Uh, once I have my template, I can build a model. And essentially building the model, the simplest way is to simply take the coordinates. So my alignment implies that these five residues correspond to these five residues. For these five residues, I know the three-dimensional structure. So I'm going to take every single coordinate point from this one, that's the known structure, to my query. Right? I'm going to just read, take over from the alignment. The alignment gives me the corresponding positions. I'm just going to take the, the, the read of the 3D coordinates. That will get into issues because now we have to assess how well our model does. Uh, and how do we assess that? Well, in some cases, we will see that just reading of the coordinate will stretch because the side chains are a little bit shorter. So my, in my query, the situation it has a different sequence. So some things are a little bit different there. And maybe uh, in, in particular case for a helix, I have to stretch it to sort of really make it fit because the helix is too quenched or something like that. Uh, so that gets to the next step where we'll try to refine. And refine in this particular case of the helix will be, well, if it is too quenched, I sort of move it out. If it is too much stretched, I push it back in. And I see whether that then would be a better model. Of course, if I sort of move something somewhere, then I sort of may introduce strain somewhere else. Uh, but you can imagine that you sort of sample over all of these in an iterative process, and you find some way of minimizing the, the number of conflicts that you have. Uh, and that ultimately is the main idea. When you ask what is the sort of limiting step, uh, when two proteins have very, very similar sequence, essentially the speed of modeling is the limiting step. When the sequence identity between the two is falling further, then at some point the quality of the model gets a problem. Further down, the alignment gets a problem, which means that you essentially make too many mistakes in aligning, and at some point when you fall further, deep into the twilight zone, you will just not find the right target. If you knew the structure, you would know what the target is, but you can't find it. Okay, those are the, the kinds of issues. Again, the way to do it is you use a Psi Blast or these uh, profile profile Markov models. Uh, then you do uh, detailed alignment, uh, build a model, and do this. I, I want to show you two ideas of state of the art methods. The first one, modeler from the Shani lab and at UCSF. Uh, here's the interface. Again, the pipeline. You first find the one that is the right fit. Then you do an alignment between target and template. Uh, then you build the model. Then you assess the model, evaluate the model. If the model is not OK, you try to change the alignment. You try to a different template. Then you try a different template, yes? Oh, yes, you do know. So at this point, the model building, so again, don't forget, what we're doing here, we align two sequences, but let's begin from the first, fold assignment. So what that means is, essentially it's also a pairwise alignment, but I find a protein in the PDB. Fold assignment means I find a protein of known three-dimensional structure, but a similar sequence to my query. Now, since I find the one in 3D, I have a three-dimensional structure, and I take these three-dimensional coordinates and put them onto my query, and that I call a model. So I have a 3D model. Right? So I can evaluate how, how, how well that looks. This is the model you, you are modeling after now. How can you assess what your model is actually modeling? So, well, that's a very subtle point. Um, okay, 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 I'm, I'm going to go a little bit back. With model evaluation, essentially what you can see is whether there are clashes. Clashes is you suddenly, uh, in the model, in the template, you had a nice bond. In the model, simply because the sequence changed, it would imply that two residues bind that are both posit positively charged. Impossible. So that is one clash. Or it would imply that you have a very long side chain and two side chains clash into each other. Impossible. So those kind of things you would see in the model 
that cannot be right and I have to bless you, I have to change. And that is the part of the model evaluation that I mean. You cannot quite see whether that is the right model, but you can see whether things are wrong in the model. Okay? Uh, and that's what I mean. So if the model is not okay, so if there are too many of these clashes, you try to change. And so one way of changing is you try to change the alignment. So maybe these two positively charged residues came next to each other because you made an alignment mistake. Maybe you should shift the alignment one over and then they're no longer close to each other, right? Could that, would that work? Is there a different alignment that also makes sense according to the pairwise sequence alignment methods? So I remember I showed you, at some point I showed you a dot plot telling you for the dynamic programming there's an optimal solution, but there may be an off diagonal or there, there may be the solution next to it that is suboptimal, that's not the best, but maybe actually it gives a better model. That you can try here. Or you can, in the most extreme case, try, is there another protein in the PDB that may not be the most similar one in sequence, uh, but where you would have fewer clashes, for fewer problems with, them, with the model. Now, in this particular case here, model OK, uh, what it suppresses, they also try to do some refinement steps. Um, on top of it. But let me give you an example for the kind of things, uh, the constraint satisfaction. So the, you, from the model you can extract all the pairwise interactions that you get. And then you can see whether these pairwise interactions, these bond lengths in those kind of situations, uh, fit to what you observe. In a, so that's the T alpha distance means that's the distance between two residues. So for your model, overall, do you see a distribution like that? Or do you see that the green for your model would bump, in, that these two Gaussians here would bump into each other? Or that they would be too far from each other? That is a simple overall score that immediately tells you something is wrong with the model. Um, if you have too many clashes, and this is what we're trying here, uh, you try, you will try to move this here off us, you will move a little bit left and right, up and down. You will sort of try to see, can I place this here alpha a little bit in a different place, such, depending on whether the two Gaussians are too close to each other, too far away from each other, you can try to optimize this, right? You move through the entire protein, Again, we have uh, uh, hundreds of residues, so moving through hundreds of residues and recompiling the energy is totally trivial. You can do that thousands of times quickly. Okay? Then you can, in fact, have some objective function. You try molecular dynamics. You can do uh, Langevin uh, dynamics, self-guided MD, rigid body optimization, rigid molecular dynamics, rigid minimization. So there's all kinds of techniques that try to see when the model doesn't fit, when the model doesn't look good, what can I do to make it look better? By moving atoms, or first of all C alpha residues, and then the atoms that I attach to them around. Um, and again, so there, there's a, a number of optimization steps, and ultimately um, that leads to a good solution. Then the typical kinds of problems that we have is that you have a clash, so you don't know whether it's this solution or that solution, and in fact you picked the wrong one. Or that the, the structure here, the right and the wrong one, so you get a little bit of a wrong turn. Uh, the, the same here. The worst case here is from a wrong template. So you believed that the best template would be that one, but it was completely wrong as a template. So you, the structure you copied is just wrong, or at least locally wrong. Uh, or that you made a very incorrect alignment. These are the typical kind of situations. Since you have an energy minimization technology from the model evaluation, you hope that the mistake that you make is increasing in the right direction on the x-axis. Uh, this is the internal score for some optimization that they do, and these are three different proteins. And what you hope is that your internal score is minimal, so it's the lowest here, for the smallest RMSD. So what you hope is that you have a, a dot somewhere here, that the, the, the lowest score that you can see, the, the fitness of the model, so to speak, uh, is always at the lowest RMSD, meaning at the point where you make least error. So the, in these cases, the developers of Modeler, they knew the answer. So they're testing how well do we do if we don't know the answer, okay? And you see here in this example, for instance, the lowest score is this in terms of their, their energy score. 
this is not the lowest score in terms of the accuracy because this one here is left of it. Right? You don't pick the best structure. You pick one that is okay. Uh, and in fact, so the difference here is quite substantial. Uh, in this particular case here, you see that the one they pick is really the best. And in this case, the one that they pick is not the best, but it's relatively close to the best. So there is one left of it. There, there are two or three or several left of it, but uh, they are not that far away as they are in this case. Yes? Yeah? Can you write that the RMS error here is between whatever you have modeled and the real figure structure? In this particular case, they know the real structure and they can simply ask, how well does our score reproduce reality? So if we, in the end, you can only use this dope score. You can only use the how well does your model fit, which is called a dope score here. Uh, that's the only way you can do, because you don't know the structure. But here, for these three cases, they simply see, is what we do right? Is, if we rely on that, what on average will we get? And ultimately, the conclusion is, we will get something that is not always the best, but it's OK. So model evaluation somehow works. You're not really getting the right thing, and I cannot really evaluate the right thing. In some sense, your question that you ask, whether, because ultimately, you're not evaluating whether you get the real thing or not. And in some sense, that's the difference between the dope score being the lowest and the RMSD being the, if, if they would converge to the same lowest score, uh, if the, there would always be a point that is most here, uh, then essentially they would be the same. And ultimately this one says we, we don't really know, we're not always finding the right model, and we're not really always measuring that, but we have a measure that evaluates models that helps us. Now what do we do if a loop is missing? So I said that insertions exist, so that sometimes when you have two particular proteins, one of them, so they have a similar shape, and one of them has a little bit more of a loop. What if that is my uh, template here, and my target has this long loop? What can I do then? Well, one way of doing it is you try to find uh, similar loops in the database. So you look at other structures that have a long loop like that, and does any one of them sort of... So you're not looking at the whole thing being similar. You're not finding another template that looks the same, but you're finding another loop that may look the same. It has the same number of residues and somehow a similar situation of anchoring uh, end residues. So you're trying to model this loop here, and my, my, my thumb and my fingers here are the anchoring residues, right? That's where the loop ends. I know these two points from the template, but I just don't know whether the loop, uh, loop is like this or like that, or the, 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 the way the loop is folded, right? I cannot show you the alternatives. With the wire, you can easily do that. It could be a peak like that, it could be a Gaussian. So it could be the Gaussian that sort of leans in that direction, that direction. All of this is unclear. Uh, and so again, one way of doing it is you find many, many loops in the database and you take some average. Or find whatever you find in the database and you take an average over that. What if the loop is entirely missing? You find nothing in the database, then essentially you try to do molecular dynamics. So molecular dynamics is sort of constrained. It's very, very complicated for real long, long, long proteins. But it does work for short fragments and loops of a few residues, uh, and that essentially shows the length of the loop here up to 14, uh, and here the mistake, so the mistake goes up, uh, here the mistake doesn't go that way, I mean, whatever. So for, for loops that are longer than 8 or 9 or 10, you cannot do it, but for shorter loops, you can actually apply molecular dynamic simulation. They are short enough, you know the ending points. If these ending points were right, is always the assumption, then you sort of can't model the, the direction of the loop. That essentially is what we do. Another method out there is called Swiss model uh, from the lab of Torsten Schwede now in, in Basel. Uh, and originally, the underlying philosophy was, in fact, that was the first comparative modeling method that was fully automated, uh, was supposed to essentially give 3D structures for non-experts. So non-experts are experimental biologists who have no understanding of structure. Um, and the underlying philosophy of the, the method really was uh, do less, you make fewer mistakes. And essentially what it did is it ran a simple alignment, it copied the coordinates, and it said end. Because the original developers said, whenever you do anything, as I described now to you, this constraint of refinement, molecular dynamics optimization, you introduce a lot of possibilities to get it wrong. 
and if you code that wrong, you will make mistakes. I don't want to make mistakes, so essentially I stop at, after step two. Uh, and you know that was a philosophy that made Swiss model famous because it allowed them to produce very very quickly a lot of models. So I said that roughly half of all the proteins you can model now we know 85 million sequences so essentially this means 40 million models, right? That's a huge number and by that you reach a huge number uh, and this became one of the most visible servers. Ever since things have changed so now Now, a Swiss model uh, is no longer that simple. There is an entire hierarchy of methods underneath uh, this. Uh, in, in, in fact, even more complicated in some sense than modeler. So the development on Swiss model over the years has, has been very intensive. And as far as automated service is concerned, this clearly is uh, the, the, the best thing out there at the moment. Uh, and in fact, it makes the protein structure available for all the proteins of unknown structure. And as I said, for about 40 million at this point. Yes? I have a question to that simplified first version of Swiss model. You say after the point two, this is an N. How come N? You should put some coordinates for something that you were not able to align, right? So how do you keep so I, I believe I didn't understand. So the second point is you copy the coordinates, and then what is your question? You, copy, you can copy the coordinates of whatever is aligned. Or yes. Whatever is not aligned. I mean something. Yes. Oh yeah. So what if I had a template, and some residues in the template, like the loops that I said, the long loops, are not aligned? What do I do with those? And essentially, the philosophy of Swiss model was, we don't know. Is it just semi? -code? No. They, end it, they really, so the algorithm is very clear, it's the way it's put up, and that's the way the server worked. They did not do any additional step. And initially, this is really true. They did not check any clash. In fact, instead of checking clash, the, the server reported, watch it, there will be clashes, because we stopped. <laughs> so, uh, and the assumption again, uh, this is tremendously successful. Um, so the assumption, let, let me get into this image here. Uh, some of you may have seen this drawing here, uh, which says Cecilia Pimpip. Cecilia Pimpip that says this is not a pipe. Okay. So this, many of you have seen that. Uh, this is not a pipe. This comes from René Magritte. What does it mean? This is not a pipe. Does anybody venture an interpretation of this title? So in this, again, uh, René Magritte uh, is sort of the, the last century by now, but I believe this was done in the 50s, I cannot quite remember. Um, so in the, oh no, 29, it was done in 29. Uh, so in those days, in fact, the, the image came with a signature, so the title was part of the image. Uh, what does it mean? An abstraction. An abstraction, yes. What do you mean by, the, by an abstraction? It's an abstraction of the item. Exactly. So this is not a pipe. This is an abstraction of a pipe. This is an image of a pipe. This is the way I, the artist, see the pipe, or the way you see the pipe. You recognize that as the object, but what you recognize is an abstraction of the actual object. The pipe is the pipe that he smokes. Oh, this, the, this is the pipe. Uh, I don't have a picture where he smokes a pipe. That's the idea. And this is the same thing. So uh, the Swiss model server put up uh, two quotes. So one uh, model must be wrong in some respects, else it would be the thing itself. So it would not, it would be the pipe, right? If it's a drawing of a pipe, it's not a pipe. Uh, the trick is to see where it's right and where it's wrong. So which of it, in some sense, uh, a model is a tool that helps to interpret biochemical data. That's Thorsten Schwedia from the, the Swiss model server. And then ultimately, this was exactly the, the, the way they sort of labeled the, the, the data saying, listen, it's up to you to find out where you believe that the model is right. So with your intuition, so this, this server was meant for biochemists, for molecular biologists, for people who use that to learn something about the proteins that they were working on. So this was essentially a call for them to think 
Where could that be right? Where could that be wrong? What do I learn from it? What is my intuition that I get from it? And so I don't have a photo of her. Uh, the late Anna Tramontano uh, traveled around with a story for many years in which at a drug company, so she was working at a drug company in, in the south of Rome, and she had built a model using comparative modeling, and in fact uh, using more the modeler type of approach, so the more detailed approach. Uh, and this model had, had led to the development of a drug. Now, ultimately the model, the, I told you at some point maybe that there's no drug that comes to the market today without doing an X-ray three-dimensional structure. When she built the model, the 3D structure was not there. From the model, they suspected that this is a good target for, to, to go for with the drug. Um, and so they essentially used a predicted structure to begin a project. During the project, they determined this 3D structure. So in that particular case, they showed whether the model or not, the, the model and the, the known structure were similar. And in that particular case, the model was wrong. It was absolutely wrong. But everything that they had said, so this would be a good drug target because it would bind there, that was right. The model was wrong, but the argument why the binding would, would work, that part of the model was actually right. And the, the argument worked through. And this is the kind of thing this means here. See the places in which you can trust your model. A model can be largely wrong, as long as the binding side, and maybe if all you want is the binding side, then all you need to make sure is that you learn from the binding side, or that you see what is right and how you can, or even from mistakes you can learn. Um, I'll leave it there. Anyway, that is what the survey.